I would like to welcome Professor Dale Bellman uh, today to the Department of Economics. Uh, Professor Bellman is uh, received his PhD from uh, University of Wisconsin and currently he's teaching at the Michigan State University Labor and Industrial School of Labor and Industrial Relations. He has uh, published widely uh, dozens of books and articles on labor issues, including uh, flexible uh, work arrangements, unions, wages, uh, in various indus industries like uh, trucking, construction, the public sector. It's a long list, okay? Uh, <clears throat> today he's going to talk about minimum wages, and this is the subject of his most recent work with uh, Paul Wolfson. And uh, as you know, okay, this uh, uh, is a very hot topic these days, and this book uh, created quite a stir. These days you can hardly hear a discussion on radio or elsewhere about minimum wages without this work being uh, cited. And uh, in 2014, uh, this book, uh, What Do Minimum Wages Do?, received the Bowen Prize as the most important book on public policy from uh, Labor Relations section of Princeton University. Uh, that's the big deal. Princeton's a big deal, but no work is complete until it's submitted in this library. So. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Well. Standards Act 
The Congress finds that the existence in industries engaged in commerce or in the production of goods for commerce of labor conditions detrimental to the maintenance of a minimum standard of living necessary for health, efficiency, and general well-being of workers. So that's our preamble. Now, as I said, and this is the dreadful cover <laughs> Paul was the one who chose it. I had a dozen other ideas, but Paul chose it along with the good people of Upchuck. Who said I in the background? I don't know, but he seems to have uh, smallpox or something. Uh, right? Yes, it is Washington. Yeah, I thought it was Paul. It might have been Paul. Uh, but one of our issues here is that there, and we started this project six years ago, we finished a year ago, uh, was to do a solid literature review of the literature on the minimum wage for developed countries from about 2000 on, actually December of 2000. There's a reason for that. That's when we had our last bloody exchange before between Card and Kruger and Newmark and Washer. The uh, general view on that was that Card and Kruger wanted it. Uh, but, uh, and the point was to go through and go through the literature very systematically. Initially, it was going to be for economists and policymakers, but it turned into really a book for economists. And it's fairly technical. But the reason for that is there are a lot of different methods out there that people use. And there are a lot of different things to think about. Let me give you. And topics. Some of the topics have to do with employment. Some have to do with wages. Others have to do with flows in the labor market. One of the topics is what's the effect of the minimum wage on school enrollment. And this, to give you just a taste of the difficulty of this, is that there was a real clash between how economists approach this and how people knew about education approaches. So, economists, being uh, given our especially labor economists tend to look and say, well, you know, we'll divide the world into teens, young adults, teens are ages 16 to 19, young adults 20 to 24, prime age, and so on. Well, unfortunately, when you're looking at school enrollment and you look at ages 16 to 19, you're actually mixing a whole bunch of different school enrollment decisions, right? You're mixing do I drop out of high school with do I go to college? And so one of the things that makes this uh, careful review of the literature valuable is as much as say, we really have to do this a bit differently. People from education had no doubt that they were going to focus on ages 16, 17, and 18. But the economists had some real problems because they just didn't think very clearly about the institutional context. So there's a lot of this that goes on. We read far more than 200 articles, usually several times. It was an experience I not, I hope never to repeat. <laughs> uh, but a lot of a lot of insights. And one of the advantages of doing a literature review is, of course, you know where the holes in the literature are, and you desperately race to fill them in before anyone else does it. But uh, we won the Bowen Award uh, from. Princeton with this, uh, and I think with that prize and the uh, grant we got, uh, we're still below minimum wage per hour. <laughs> <laughs> the people at Upjohn smile a lot when they hear that. So, what about the new minimum wage research? Well, again, what happened was we have a 1991 conference in Cornell. Minimum wage basically wasn't researched from about 1980 to the early 90s. But then we have a series of federal minimum wage increases, and we have a conference at Cornell. Uh, Card and Kruger probably turned out the most famous study, which is looking at fast food employment between New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Uh, but we also have the uh, Newmark and Washer show up with their state by year panels and things like that. Some of the things about this, however, is most of the research which took place, it's reviewed ably by uh, Brown, Gilroy, and Cohen, was pretty homogeneous. It was all about teenagers. It was all time, pretty much all time series research 
and looking back, perhaps using technologically obsolete methods, but uh, you know, univariate time series and all that. Suddenly, we get to you know, we we take the 80s off from this and work on other topics, and come back, and suddenly we get research that's far more heterogeneous than the earlier research. Many, many different data sources. Lots of different data structures. We move into a world of quasi-experiments versus panels, and you know, Paul and I got into this work. Actually, in 1991, we got a grant for $1,250, which since Paul was an assistant professor, he took all of that, uh, to do our first time series site. So Paul and I actually do panel time series research on the minimum wage. Many different econometric techniques. Lots of different measurements of variables. People are looking at different groups, different sectors, different, and I said, many different issues that show up in here, other than you know, how we're going to measure employment and so on. So we get a very heterogeneous literature. And that poses problems of how do you summarize this? Uh, what I would tell you in terms of summarizing it uh, is that. One, you know, 450 pages later, we thought we'd done an okay job, but we actually had to cut a chapter out uh, just to keep the thing in a decent light. But in summarizing it, we saw a real need in what we were doing to, if you will, uh, you know, we went through, talked about employment issues at length, lots of precision. How do you summarize that? How do you take 80 studies, or actually probably about 38 studies that you could and put them together and say anything about them other than, boy, there are a lot of estimates out there, especially because some of them are positive, some are zero, some are negative. You know, how do you reconcile all of these? So what do we do? Well, that's where I think meta-analysis comes in, meta-regression is we're going to go through and collect point estimates and standard errors along with a lot of other information from every study we can get our hands on. Uh, and what then we're going to point estimates of what? Well, point estimates of the elasticity, of the effect of the uh, minimum wage on employment. So we've got point estimates of that. We restrict ourselves to that, or hours estimates. So employment or hours, we look almost too bad aspects of that. And what we're essentially going to do is we're going to estimate a regression model in which the effect, the elasticity, is our dependent model and essentially in the very simplest across all these different models or estimates come up with an average. So that's what meta regression is going to provide to us is an average effect. Uh, and so our beta zero here is the average elasticity across estimates articles. Now it gets a whole lot more complex than that. Uh, and so I'm going to rattle a lot a little more than this. But I think what's important here is to realize why it becomes complex. One, we have lots of different methods. Two, we have different numbers of estimates coming out of the, each article. There are articles with one or two estimates. There are articles with more than 100 estimates. And there's actually an example of where this becomes an issue uh, in the research literature. There's a classic study of the effect of expenditures on educational performance, uh, which finds that there is no effect. That the more money you spend, nothing happens. Uh, Alan Kruger went back and redid that and noticed that really what was going on in that original meta article was that there were a couple articles that found no effect with lots and lots of estimates. And so if you take every possible estimate, throw it in, and treat them as independent, then you know the articles with lots of estimates are going to dominate the results. Once you correct for that and allow for the fact the estimates are not independent, then in fact spending more <coughs> does increase educational attainment. Unfortunately, for about 15 years, we believe the reverse. Uh, Okay, so where do we go? We start with 57 studies of U.S. data since AER 2000 exchange. Uh, this is the exchange I talked about in which, uh, you know, there were, it's, I would say, an important breakwater because what happened was is a, 
uh, Newmark and Washington had claimed that they had shown that Card and Kruger's methods were wrong. Uh, Card and Kruger came back and showed that Newmark and Washington had actually used some uh, highly suspicious data. And once you remove that, uh, the Newmark and Washer results it looked like Card and Kruger. Everyone walked away, sort of going, Phew. "That was a nasty exchange." I think Card and Kruger got the better of it, but. Uh, we use that as kind of a marker, and we look at our studies of U.S. data since that point. Okay. The focus in this has been, is there a statistically significant employment effect? Does raising the minimum wage actually reduce employment? Now, I, I should point out here, in thinking about employment reductions, of course, we're, for the most part, we're arguing over whether we have a elasticity that's not statistically significant or it's equal to somewhere in the range of uh, negative 0.1. This is probably the only place in economics where we think that elasticities of 0.1 in absolute value have any policy relevance at all. But there you are. Uh, you know, I'm not going to take on the profession. One of our problems is not all studies report results in standard units that we can use, and not all authors are willing to provide us with the information we need. So we have some new mark, and walk. we end up with 35 studies where we have elasticity standard error pairs. 35 studies, we have some new mark and washer, others we've written them several times over the years. They haven't given anything to us. We, in turn, have refused to give anything to them. It's kind of a standoff. But we have a total of 927 velocity <laughs> standard error pairs. And the number range from one observation in one study to more than 100 per study. Michael Wright is particularly notorious for doing very large numbers of variants on his models. But that doesn't make any difference in the end. We adjust for that. Now, Let's talk a little bit about what things look like. This is known as a funnel graph. And what is it? Well, what a funnel graph is, is along here, each, each of these little circles is a ordered pair, elasticity, and precision. What is precision? It's one over the standard here. Okay. And as we know, big standard error, bad, little standard error, good, in general. Uh, so we've got the elasticities arrayed along here. And then we've got the precision. But by the way, these are what we've got here are, this is a log scale here, but we've got the values of the standard errors here. So negative one to show it's precision. But the larger standard errors are towards the bottom. The smaller standard errors are towards the top. Our mean elasticity uh, is negative 0 0.018. Our median is negative 0 0.031. And then, uh, but so notice the shape of it. or 048? You know, it might be 48. It's still too small to care about. I was wondering, those are the two possibilities, but it's kind of hard to see. I can take a look on the screen, but it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Anyway, but why do we call this a funnel plot? Well, because very typically when you array, set up an array for a number of estimates like this, it does look like a funnel, right? And what we find is that the estimates with the very small standard errors tend to concentrate pretty close to the mean value and those with large standard errors tend to be spread out like that. And so just that. And by the way, this is very important because one of the things we want to do is, is use information about the standard error, the precision with which our models are estimated to weight the results. Yes? Do you think it accounts how these standard errors are calculated in the studies? I mean, sometimes it might be appropriate to we take uh, what we do. Okay, that's an issue of heterogeneity. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're very big on clustering, especially after uh, uh, Bertrand, Duflo, and I forget Mulholland. No. But yeah, when you're doing, there's some issues about when you're doing state by time panels about having to cluster the standard errors to deal 
deal with some issues of auto correlation. <coughs> what we do is we take whatever the authors have done as a given, but we put in control. So for example, uh, we'll have a control in there for clustered standard errors. And we'll be able, in essence, to extract any systematic differences having to do with clustering or not clustering. But that, that's further in the actual statistical analysis. This is, but that does turn out to be very important and we have considerable discussion of it. And actually, basically, in terms of our discussion, we discount a large number of articles because they didn't cluster the standard errors, so their hypothesis tests are biased upwards. But no, we, have, we haven't done that in the funnel graph. But this gives us an idea of what uh, is going on. It's reasonably symmetric, which is good. So the 933 is out of 37 articles, so is that right? Yes. And so basically you're looking on average of 30 estimates per article? Roughly. A little below that, I think. Okay. Yeah. We have all, there are articles that just and, pour out estimates. And those differences in estimates come because they're stepwise uh, incorporation of variables or because they're looking at different Things, what is basically driving the multiple okay. estimates from a single? Well, for example, it might be sensitivity test, testing, which is to say, well, what if rather than looking at the full population, we look at just women or just men? That would give you three different estimates. Right. Or Michael Wright, who likes to say, well, I'm going to start with the canonical model, and then I'm going to put in a set of controls <laughs> For division and time that I believe that we believe are important for these reasons, and he'll step you through it, and pretty soon you have 45 estimates in a single article. Right. So in this case, and, and we have one where we, there uh, we have over 100 estimates in an article, but we can control for that. We can eliminate that. You can eliminate what what we do. We're going to end up with a regression model with essentially both uh, fixed effects by article and clustering of errors to deal with the issue of multiple estimates per article. So that, that's a way of trying to get at both multiple estimates and not independence of those estimates. So we're getting there. Uh, there's a little bit to do. Well, uh, thinking about meta-regression and really the people who've been leading this are Tom Stanley and Chris DiCoulogios. Uh, Tom's been doing this for 30 years. They do have a text on meta regression, which uh, somehow I ended up with a uh, electronic copy of, which was very nice. Read it on the plane. But really, so they say there are three issues that we have to consider before estimating a reliable mean effect size. And those are heteroscedasticity, uh, sample selection bias, and heterogeneity. So let me go through each of these and describe what the issue is and how to deal with them. The heteroscedasticity is pretty basic. There's no reason to believe that the errors, remember we have effect, is a mean effect size plus an error term, or our beta zero coefficient. There's no reason to believe that that's a, that our standard error is constant. It's not specific to an article or to an estimate. So we have heteroscedasticity, have to, you know, almost certainly. So that's one thing that you have to deal with in here. The second is sample selection bias. And let me say there are two distinct forms of sample selection bias that we face in the literature. One is an obvious one, which is either from the point of view of the researcher, the referee, or the editor, maybe there are things that they like and things that they don't like. And they're not going to consider the things that they don't like. And we'll kind of preemptively, and sometimes we do this to ourselves. We get an estimate, we look at it and say, that can't possibly be true. And, you know, we torture the data for a while. Without any luck, it goes away. Uh, but, you know, and Paul and I, in our career of doing work on the minimum wage have been convinced that there are certain journals where sending something that does not find a negative and statistically minimum wage effect is about as useful as spitting into the wind. <laughs> uh, so you, that's one form, that's kind of the obvious form. People 
And here, I mean, economists do tend to do this, which is they have models, and models tell them what the world should look like. And if you get results which are at variance with those models, why then? You must have done it wrong, right? It's not, statisticians have a different point of view because they have a better handle on what sampling means. But there's a, you know, so maybe there's a bias in here. Now, we didn't see that in the funnel graph, oddly enough, the funnel chart, because there it was pretty symmetric around the mean. There wasn't a lot of evidence of asymmetries. But there's a more subtle form of bias, which is probably it is rampant in research literature, and it goes like this. People like big effect sizes, and they like them to be statistically significant. And so Art Goldberger, many, many years ago, noticed that the uh, T statistics that appear in published research do not have a T distribution. Um, <laughs> but what it comes down to is this, and, and this is strongest in medical literature, and we're starting to see, we actually saw a psychology study recently on replication. It goes like this. The very best journals want to see big effect sizes, big magnitudes, and high statistical significance. So what happens is, you know, you get, people are lucky. They pull a sample. It provides a big effect size. It's highly statistically significant. You can put that in the JPE or the AER. Then, or, you know, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. Then what happens pretty consistently over time is that it's more, now that the door is open for doing these studies, as people start doing these studies, you don't get these unusual, you know, these extreme samples anymore, and both the effect size and statistical significance drops away over time. So that, for example, there's a recent study, a replication study of a hundred key articles in psychology. And it came back, you know, and they did a really beautiful job. Because they went back to the original authors and had them help. And what they came back was two-thirds, you know, the people say, well, they didn't replicate. Well, that's not really true. What when they say they don't replicate, what they meant is for two-thirds of the study, they ended up with uh, coefficients that were about half the sizes in the original study and were no longer significant. 5% test. Well, that's exactly what this is uh, about in terms of selection, is that maybe people are getting lucky, they find an extreme sample, and that gets published, but the ones that, you know, uh, you don't have a journal of the null hypothesis out there, which reports all the studies where we didn't find anything. If I, if I could just distinguish between two types of sample selection, it seemed to be you seem to be raising here. One is uh, publication bias. Right. Uh, basically, the sample of published articles that you found that you're going to use represent some sort of selection of, of work. The other is basically in the studies, like in the restaurant workers amongst New Jersey versus Pennsylvania, there's some sort of bias within the sample of the study itself that basically distorts the results. And you're saying the first rather than the latter. That's what I'm hearing you. It's a publication yeah. bias. That's the sample bias you're talking right. about, and not addressing the issue of basic. Although when you got to the last point here, you were saying there's this massive study done of some yeah. distinct group that that's different. <laughs> that really gets smacked in the second. So I think there's two things here. I was wondering if you wanted to conflate those, or if you wanted to emphasize that you're basically talking about the publication. Yeah, we're talking about publication. Although it is possible to have bias in the sense of, these are the results I like, I won't stand for my journal publishing anything else. Probably exists. Right. But the real issue is this uh, the type of publication bias that we run into, I think I'm using the term correctly, which is that we like to publish the best journals, and even the modestly good journals like to publish things with big effect sizes and highly significant, which means that out of the universe of research that is done or could be done, right. there's a lot that never makes it yeah. into public. And I'm just saying that it is interesting to think about also the issue as to whether there's something very specific that's been excluded in a study or that, that, that could smack of a selection bias. And uh, so the quality of the studies, I, I understand how you've addressed these it sounds like there are multiple regressions.
some extent, it's kind of interesting. But some aspects of some of the earlier uh, of, of, of this work also just can reflect certain samples that are distorted, and they're not sure. really, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, could you give an example of what you mean? Well, let's say that basically in Pennsylvania, there were some other kinds of institutional regulation on safety at the same time that, uh, that the, the minimum wage didn't change there or something, right. okay? And that affected the restaurant industry and the employment in that industry. And you're not really accounting properly for, the, uh, you might incorporate some fixed effect or something else, but it's not really addressing the fact that it's either due to some other factor or that basically restaurant workers is not the one you know, not the one you should be looking at with respect to. Well, you know, that, that's certainly possible. Now, I think in that case, one of the nice things about the New Jersey and Pennsylvania study is that you're using counties immediately on the border so that, and doing the way the data was collected, I think that the odds were pretty much against that sort of problem. But we run into that all the time right. where there are coincident factors that you should have in a model, but don't. Okay, that that's you know that that's a uh, that's a distinct form of bias of coefficients where they're they're proxying for other things. Right. The prenatal care study, for example, if you do people selecting the prenatal care right. for a variety of reasons, and if but basically if that's a select group, if there's sample selection there. And the effect size on birth outcomes is going to be different. Sure. That's, so that's the typical way that right. we consider the sample selection bias. Right. This is a publication bias interesting. In that, right. in that. Yeah, and, and you know, but the sample selection bias, as we'll see, uh, I'll come back around to that and how we deal with it. But tetrogeneity, I'm sorry about the top being chopped off, but uh, one, there, one form of this is dependence among estimates from the same sample. What do I mean by that? Well, Michael Reich has a, you know, using one or two data sets, cranks out 20 estimates per data set. Those estimates are not independent of each other, and so you can't treat them as if they have the same weight as an estimate. You know, one person is sort of the one bullet, one kill, I've got the estimate I like, here it is. So you have to deal with that. But there are also differences in study design. So we've got the kind of typical regression study, which is the sort of new Mark and Washer panel of state data over time uh, versus a quasi-experiment, which is actually the way most of this research is now going, which is uh, still a regression design, but one with much better defined comparator groups. And so you've got some good, and then you've got time series. So study designs are heterogeneous now. Different data sets and data sources. Uh, what period is under consideration? There's no reason to believe that the minimum, the impact of the minimum wage is constant over time. Uh, there are lots of additional factors over there. I will show some of them to you. So for example, uh, of these, Estimates, you know, source of heterogeneity. Of our total 900 some odd estimates, uh, 406 refer to members of a demographic group. Uh, 354 look at an industry, eating and drinking establishments. Uh, another 138 look at members of a demographic group in an industry, teenagers in eating and drinking places. And then 35 look at other sources of the data. The most common is the current population survey. The QCEW, 187, QWI, uh, 153, other 206. We've got different data sources. All of these, you know, could be producing somewhat different effects. What is the QWI? Uh, let's see. Quarterly workforce indicators. Uh, quarterly census of employment and wages. That's actually unemployment insurance data. It is not a survey, it's a census. Uh, whether the elasticity was for hours of employment, 163, or employment itself, various forms, 770. Frequency of the data, biannual, 20, annual, 250, quarterly, 506. But you get the idea. Geographic reach, national, multi-state, state, city, and other. By the way, we're, with this research, we are only looking at US studies. 
Uh, the analysis contained in this estimate in this has been published 487. Again, we don't, you know, that may make no difference at all, but still worth knowing. Uh, I should understand that. What? Some have been published and some haven't. Some are NBER working papers, some are available that way. Oh, so published means peer review. So you're not you're not limiting to peer review research. No. You you'll look at working papers as well. We'll look at working papers. And does that help you with your publication bias? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I've looked at that whole thing. Yes. On the publication bias, everything on the off norm side. Symmetry and essentially uh, symmetry around zero being funnel. Doesn't it say that has to be washed out somewhere? Washed. Uh, I mean, the, the, actually, if you take a look, and we'll, I'll go back to the funnel. <coughs> One of the things you'll notice in here is the density, you know, very dense up in here, but density is clearly much lower right down in here. <coughs> and, and Stanley and Kurt Tom and Chris argue that that could be evidence of the sort of publication oh, bias, is that we're not getting a lot which are not going to be statistically significant. You can create essentially a pyramid of a T statistic of 2.0. Uh, you had a question? No, I, I was just thinking, I mean, I, I, I would separate the publication bias you, you talked about in two different categories. Right. One, confirmation bias, where they have the journals and want to publish right. whatever it believes. But then also publication bias in terms of that they don't only want to publish significant large results. And, I mean, does that, is that really true for minimum wage research? Isn't a zero effect very interesting for minimum wage well, research? Well, it has become interesting, but in point of fact, uh, the, we don't know if it exists or not. We just know that we have to be concerned about that and want to control for it. And I'm perfectly happy to find that, in fact, there isn't that sort of bias. But we can't a priori assume that there's a question in that. So the publication bias, does that mean that the studies with no statistical significance aren't getting published, or that um, people doing the, the scientists doing the studies are, are trying to tweak the data in order to make it? Well, we have to assume that significant. they're actually, what, you know, it's a well-known well, I didn't find anything there, but if I beat up this data enough, maybe with any luck I'll find something. So that could be going on. Another one is it may not be the editors or referees. It may be, you know, Peter just takes a look and says, well, there's not a journal of an null hypothesis, so I'm just going to throw these results away. It may be self-censoring, but it's still, I mean, whereas a statistician, okay, old story, okay, which is, a professor in an econometrics, undergraduate econometrics class, creates a data set of random data. He's got 20 students. And he says, okay, here's the hypothesis, here are the variables, here's the hypothesis I want you to test. And actually, he doesn't create just one data set, he creates 20 data sets. So he gives it a different data set to each student. And he says, I want you to test this hypothesis in a 5% test. Well, it's, it's random data. He's just generated that. So what happens? 19 of the 20 students find nothing and go to law school. <laughs> and one finds a significant result and goes on to graduate school in economics. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, statisticians are better at saying, this is the nature of sampling. If we use a 5% test, 1 in 20 times when there's no relationship, we're going to find a relationship. Our problem is, that the best journals tend to publish that one in 20, and we ignore the other 19. Okay, so that's, oops, now I got it. Well, this is the John Bates Clark Award effect in this case, because the null hypothesis made it in when that article, when that guy came up with the result. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, that's the other part of it, really. It's a matter that nobody who is coming out from a, uh, you know, the regular group is going to get it in, but when Card Kruger do it, yeah. it's going to get in. That's right. I mean, there, there, there are that sort of thing. And again, uh, you'll see how we deal with some of that. Uh, again, get more, either the data structure for this estimate is not one that would raise suspicions about standard errors or they've been resolved. 
there's some where by clustering there's some, and you brought this up. What if we have the wrong standard errors? And the answer is, you know, in most at this point, people are using correct standard errors, but we've got about 80 which are failing to cluster or something. Uh, employment of teenagers, 476, most overstudied group of the minimum wage industry. Who cares about teenagers? <laughs> uh, my 16-year-old daughter, I'm starting to care about her less and less. <laughs> Seems to mistake me for a chauffeur. <laughs> employment in the drinking establishments, 205. Employment of those whose schooling ended before receiving a high school degree, 29. Females, 36. Males, 27. Estimate is reported to replicate prior work of others. Now, this is an interesting problem that uh, we've been dealing with. And uh, what do you do with your someone that wants, you know, cut? Puts, starts off with saying, you see, I replicated their work, and now I'm going to show how they should have done it. Do you count that as a good estimate? Okay, because to some degree, it's not really what the authors care about. So after half an hour arguing, you know, Paul wanted to toss them out. I said, we have to keep them in. He said, I'm tossing in a dumping variable for the who's involved. Okay, that'll work. And some other things. A Giddings and Schmutz are just insane. They have 116 estimates of it, actually. Long story. So you have a Schmutz dummy bird? Yes. <laughs> yes, we have a Schmutz dummy. Uh, anyway, well, what are our solutions? I pose what the issues are. I, I hope you're convinced that the data is very heterogeneous. Well, for heteroskedasticity, it's pretty straightforward. We have this model with an effect K, you know, our elasticity, beta 0 plus UK, where UK is distributed as a normal zero variance, and, you know, that we simply divide everything through by the precision 1 over the standard error. That gives us a weighted least squares result. Now, oddly enough, when you divide the, this by the standard error, you get a t-statistic on the left-hand side. So we're actually estimating models with t-statistics. We get uh, our beta zero is now multiplied one over the standard error. Statistics <coughs> text would be called precision. So we're, the key variable we're interested in is going to be the coefficient on precision in here. And then we get uh, a new error term. So that's how we deal with heteroscedasticity. Sample selection bias is a little harder. Yes? Can I switch on the previous slide? Sure. Why, why do we? Why do we assume that the errors are normally distributed? Oh, uh, because it's a reasonable first cut. We don't have any reason to believe that they're not. And frankly, with a very large number of observations, there's with lots of different sources in the errors, there's every reason to believe that it would be normal. You could test for it if you wanted, but as a first cut, this is, it seems more than that. Oh, go ahead. Well, uh, suppose that. We had uh, a whole bunch of studies that were looking at teenagers and a whole bunch of other studies that were looking at, I don't know, 50 year olds. Right. And so most of the heterogeneity was in terms of that. And that actually the effect of minimum wage is quite different on these two groups. Right. And now we're lumping them all together. Um, I, I just wonder about the, the statistical properties of this well, sample. But if the errors of group water normally distributed, and the errors of group two are normally distributed, the combined errors will also be normally distributed. Uh, I think you're thinking more of heterogeneity in combining them. I don't think that, you know. Well, they, but basically, um, they'll have very there different two, distributions. There might, be two yeah, there might be two coefficients. In reality, there are two coefficients, but you're thinking, what is the effect of the well, minimum wage? On? Okay, but what you're saying is what you want to do is some different estimates for subgroups, and that's yeah. where we're going to go. Uh, oh, all right. Have no fear. I don't really care about, you know, what I'm going to do is show you the estimates for teenagers, for men and women, for people with less than a high school degree, for eating places. I could show you a whole lot more because each one of the conditions that we're dealing with the heterogeneity, we could, if we wanted to, pull that coefficient out and look at it. But I agree with you, we can have very different effects for different groups, and that's part of our question. Actually, if you take a look, uh, this last month's industrial relations, Paul and I had an article called, Who is Affected by the Minimum Wage? Which 
specifically breaks it down into subgroups and says, it's not really interesting to look, you know, what's the overall effect? Most of us are not the average person in the United States, therefore we're interested in effects on subgroups. Okay, well, what's the canonical Heckman correction? And this is one of my favorite. It was part of my dissertation. I've been living off selection correction ever since. Uh, but our issue here is essentially that in the traditional example, uh, you know, Norm brought up one, but uh, example in labor economics would be with training programs. Assume that we have a group that is non-randomly selected into a training program. All right. My problem is, is that their error, their error terms are no longer normally distributed. And essentially, certain unobserved characteristics such as native ability is going to bias the measured effect of the training program. Because a smart person running a training program is not going to randomly allow people in. He or she will allow the people who are going to be successful in. And they may observe things for people. So that's a very traditional selection issue. Well, so what in a Heckman selection model, we're trying to remove the bias associated with selection. So if we're doing this as a uh, two models, our linear model would be y equals x beta plus mu, where mu is distributed as a normal. Uh, and without selection, we just have some standard error, some variance in there. But our problem is, is that we have selection. We don't have a random select. This equation is not estimated on a random selection of individuals. It's estimated on a select group. Well, in that case, by the way, the probability of selection conditional on information Z, uh, we can estimate that with a probit or linear probability model. But what's our expectation of Y based on our explanatory variables and being selected into it? Well, again, we have X beta plus we have an inverse Mills ratio. The inverse Mills ratio is the expected value of a truncated normal. Okay, so let's suppose in this up here, we're only selecting people with very high values on unobservables. Well, then we'll be truncating this at some point and only seeing the large values on our error term. So we have a truncated normal. And so what Heckman says is toss in this inverse Mills ratio, and you're going to coefficient, which is our error term, multiplied by rho, which is the correlation between error term in the selection model and the error term in the linear model. So again, lambda z gamma is the inverse Mills ratio. It's a truncated normal. Uh, our coefficient, again, is our, um, you know, our error term multiplied by the correlation between the error term in the linear model and the selection model. So that would be our typical solution if we had observations on the unselected data. Uh, in meta regression, and just for simplicity, I'm going to put E1i, Br, uh, lambda, our inverse Mills ratio. What we're going to end up with is something uh, with selection, if we could control for the selection, which will be beta 0 plus u or beta 0 plus rho, sigma, and our lambda term, our inverse Mills ratio heteroscedasticity in there, then we'll end up with uh, beta 0 plus rho times our uh, heteroscedastic error term plus the inverse Mills ratio. Well, we're still up having a problem here. So we could do this. Well, I saw we told you how we observe uh, how we get our selection criteria to happen. Now the magic begins. All this is 30-year-old stuff. Here's our problem. Typical in a selection model, in our training problem, or in our neonatal problem, we can observe the people who are selected in and the people who are not selected in. And so we can estimate our selection model and estimate our inverse Mills ratio, throw it in and do all of that. We can't do that here because we cannot observe the articles that are not available to us. Okay. Remember Peter being disgusted with his results because they weren't statistically significant, threw it in a drawer. 
I'm not going to go all over the world and go through drawers to try to find the articles that were omitted. Actually, I put your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you didn't nail it. No, I nailed it to the journal. <laughs> okay. All right, so we can't estimate our inverse Mills ratio. However, the error term is actually that we get is an estimate of our error term in our model. So back here, back here, we actually have an estimate of uh, sigma here, or if you will, here and here. So we've got an estimate of sigma. And so what uh, Tom and Chris suggest, and the econometrics hold up, is that we're going to end up with one of two ways of dealing with this. One is uh, our elasticity can be estimated allowing for bias is that we put in a term around either the uh, standard deviation of our variable or the squared standard deviation in case it's not constant across the assuming that our inverse Mills ratio is not going to be constant. Either one of those will perform the same ratio roughly as the inverse Mills ratio in this case. So that's a way of trying to deal with selection bias. And we're actually going to come out and say there's a lot of evidence of selection bias in this literature. About the only large and statistically significant coefficient is the selection bias coefficient. Finally, what's our solution for heterogeneity? Well, first we're going to test for it. And to do that, we use Cochrane's Q. And our idea is after we've dealt with heteroscedasticity and with uh, sample selection, uh, Basically, we shouldn't find that there's any heterogeneity. So we can use Cochrane's Q test on this uh, and look at our sum squared residuals under the null that, in fact, our error terms are homogeneous. And if we reject it, we incorporate our other explanatory variables. In point of fact, when we go through, we get up with a Cochrane's Q somewhat greater than 2,000. The results I'm going to show you today are hot off the presses as of Wednesday of last week. So we haven't quite updated all of our tests, but everything we've done with Cochrane's Q suggests heterogeneity. Uh, that's not real surprising, but with each of our estimates, that's what we're finding. Uh, and this is our weight in the squares estimates and clustering within our errors within studies. So how do we deal with heterogeneity? Well. I talked about our possible explanatory variables, and we really have a couple sets of them. Uh, the first is, the first big source of heterogeneity are particles. Okay? Again, part of our issue is that we have different numbers of observations per article. So we're going to essentially need to have dummy variables by article to deal with that. And then there are all the other issues that we've worked with that I've talked about, and we're going to need a way of controlling for that, and our basic way is going to be with uh, W variables. Now, uh, a couple different ways. Simplest is with dummies, including article dummies. You just go beta 0 plus uh, Z, where Z is a matrix of appropriate dummy variables with R, and that should probably, that should actually be a beta 1. Uh, no, actually it is beta 0. Just put in all the dummy variables that you think are appropriate the different things that could cause heterogeneity, put them in there, and this will pull, you know, remove those sources. Now, if you're going to allow for heteroscedasticity, again, remember we divided through by precision, so we now have a t-statistic on our left-hand side. We have our correction here for sample selection, and we now have v0 times precision right, with a diagonalized, okay, so we had that previously, that's going to be our estimate of the joint elasticity, but we also need to take a diagonalized uh, precision, ZB, this is a uh, matrix, Z is again a matrix of uh, appropriate dummies, and B is a vector of coefficients. It gets more uh, more elaborate once we've allowed for selection. I'm not going to walk you through that. There are an awful lot of different pieces, but you have to build it up. So we end up with a final model that deals with 
heterogeneity selection and heterogeneity. It's a pretty big model, but we now have a different issue. We have an awful lot of dummy variables, <laughs> and you actually can't even estimate this model because of the collinearity. So there's some different ways of dealing with this. One would be a, a stepwise procedure, uh, which would simply say, for most of these variables, we don't really care about them per se. We just care, care about controlling for these different factors. So we don't really care about the coefficient on the article numbers. We only care that we control for articles and things like that. Well, if you tried to do a conventional stepwise, it wouldn't work. But it's actually extremely unstable. So what we've used is least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. And so our purpose here is to get a model that will, uh, you know, we're interested in minimizing the number of coefficients we're estimating subject to certain criteria. So what we're going to do, uh, the lasso, and you can find this in SAS, uh, there's also code out there for doing it in Stata. And again, uh, we're going to minimize the absolute value of y minus x beta squared. Okay, so that's just closely akin to a sum of squared residuals. Subject to that the sum of the absolute value of all of our coefficients is less than some constant. And the x's are all centered and scaled to a mean zero on a unit standard deviation. And what we can show is that if t is set sufficiently small, then some regression coefficients will be zero. So this will give us a model that can be estimated in the end. Now, there are a couple of different ways of doing this. There's a locked and an unlocked version. In the locked version, you can specify variables that you believe have, that you want to keep in there. So for example, if we're concerned with uh, gender, we can force gender to remain in this model. If we want those article dummies in there, and in point of fact, we want the article dummies in there, we can force them to remain in there. So that would be a locked model. There's also an unlocked model where you just toss everything in, you turn it on. It's probably not quite the phrase I want to use in a context. But you basically turn Stata on, you've got the programming, and it spits out a model which may or may not have the variables that you're really interested in afterwards. Okay. When that, so we do both of these, turns out not to make any difference because what we do is that if certain variables such as the gender dummies are tossed out, we put them back in afterwards because they're really the ones we're interested in. But the lock and the unlock results are about the same. Also, we can cluster the residuals to allow for non-independence. Remember, we've got article dummies in there. So the article dummies will pull off any unique part of estimate that's unique to that article. But we still have non-independence in our error terms by articles. We still have to cluster the errors by article. And you can use the lasso to do that. And Dan, yes. so this uh, shrinkage approach yeah. is stable, whereas stepwise is unstable? Stepwise is unstable. We, you know, we first used the basic state of stepwise that would blow up because of collinearity. Then Paul and I programmed our own uh, variant on it, and it was, uh, we would find if we, you know, basically we would get different results for essentially the same run. So we don't like that. Very and in, in, in this case, it never blows up. And it, never, it, it never, never blows blow up. up. It, it's extremely stable. Uh, if you go into SAS, uh, stepwise is kind of a, it's a, it's a fine 1960s technology, but it's not really very, it's not very robust. Lasso is extremely robust. There's been a whole lot more statistical work on the lasso. Plus, I thought you guys out west here we do a different kind of lasso. Okay, so now, one last thing. When we get to our final stage of estimation, uh, one of the problems we run into in the 
using an extensive set of dummy variables, is you have an arbitrary base group. I think he used this in an Ohaka. You have an arbitrary base group. So, you know, when you take a look at your results at the end, you say, well, you know, here is how much, you know, the effect of women relative to men. Or here's the effect of uh, labor is relative to clericals. And you get some really unintuitive base groups. And it's hard to interpret. So an op a, uh, alternative is deviation coding. Let me show you what it is. This is taken from a state of uh, regression with state of angle uh, by Chen, Ender, Mitchell, and Wells. So, uh, and this is just some scores from a some sort of writing exam. Typical coding is we'd have three variables. We might take Latinos as our base group across all three, and then we'd have an A, what we probably call an Asian dummy variable. Give that one, zero elsewhere, a black dummy variable, and a white dummy variable. And then we'd be using Latinos as our base group, and we'd be estimating the effect of uh, you know, race and uh, ethnicity relative to Latinos. There's another way of doing this that's going to give us a relative to an average, the grand average across these groups, called deviation coding. And in this case, the only difference is we're going to put the Latinos in as negative 1 as opposed to 0. So you're, what in essence is your shared base group, you're going to put in as negative 1s, and then aside from that, it's going to be the same. When you do that, OK, Again, I've got the group means, all right? So we've got the group means for Asian. Uh, their writing score or reading score is 58, black 48.2, white 54.1, Hispanic 46.45. And the mean of these means, you add them up and divide by 4, is 51.68. With a conventional dummy variable, you're going to be measuring everything relative to 46, okay? With deviation coding, Everything's going to be measured relative to this mean of mean. So the Asians' deviation code value will be 6.32. Of course, you add 6.32 to 51.68, you'll get 58, and so on. So this is a way of coding things where you've got qualitative outcomes so that you're doing it off of a common base, and it's easier to interpret. Notice that although in our estimates we don't get a value for Hispanic, it would be very easy to pull out a value for Hispanic from here. So it's a very valuable method. I first ran across it in your paper, then Paul brought it up. And so this is the way we've coded it, because I want to take you to results. You know, I dragged you through an awful lot. So what are our results? What do we find? Well, first of all, let's so we've got both the, you know, a measure of the average elasticity across all groups. We've got estimates for men and women. We've got estimates for teens, for no high school eating and drinking places. And we've got estimates of the correction for selection bias. We have a whole lot more estimates in there, but I'm not going to trouble you with them. Uh, so what we've done here, and let's, let's just start off. Uh, the constant, which is the correction for selection bias, has a coefficient of negative 0.544. That's hard to interpret. Uh, but it's highly statistically significant. What this suggests is that there is substantial bias in uh, either public, either the way that uh, articles are selected for publication in the sense that people like or don't like results in terms of size and significance, or there's a sort of publication bias is we only like to have things with big effect size and small standard errors. Either way, we see a lot of evidence in here, and it actually reduces, if you take a look at this, saying that it's pushing the elasticity down very substantially. Okay, so there is some form of negative selection bias. What about our elasticity? Just stay with that for a minute, just a second. So that saying that it thinks that the literature uh, is uh, downwardly biasing the true uh, employment of 
licensee of demand? That is correct. And very substantially. It's the only large and statistically significant coefficient we find in the entire study. So it's saying that in its opinion, the economists researching this topic that get published are on, as a group, estimating too low. It would say that the stuff that is appearing uh, in the sources we have it has a pretty large element of selection bias. And I don't know. I mean, this is why Newmark won't models. share data with you. That what? And this is why Newmark won't share data with you. I have no idea why he won't. He was doing it long before we published any of this stuff. I'm not sharing data with you. No. no. Okay. Now, in terms of our coefficients, our base elasticity, which comes off of our precision variable, has a coefficient of 0.008 and a standard error that's about an order of magnitude greater and a terribly small t statistic. They, you know, remember Charlie Brown in his work on the minimum wage sort of initially started out with a range of negative 0.1 to 0.3. In his next review article, he said it seemed closer to negative 0.1. What this says is it is vanishingly small. We're talking three decimal points now. So no evidence that our elasticity is big enough for anyone to really care about. Now what we've done here, I mean, doesn't that have the wrong sign? No, because it's not statistically significant. But I mean, the, our point estimate has the wrong sign. But, but you know, again, this is a sample. In terms of the population, we don't, given it's not significant, we don't know if the population value is positive, negative, or zero. We just know it's incredibly small. So, lay on since it's wrong. So. In, in, in the literature, is it not always assumed that this is a one pill test? Uh, we, our standard that we used in the book was a two tail 5% test. Why? From a theoretical perspective, would it be a two-tail test? Because we like to pretend to be statisticians rather than economists, and that that's a widely five percent widely accepted. Two, uh, it makes sense to us to simply say we have to be neutral with respect to effects. All right, we don't know whether they're positive, negative, or not significant. Even if it were a one-tail test. At a 20 percent level, this wouldn't pass. Could you give us a sense as to what um, the other yeah. uh, variables were that were included? Sure. Uh, we had a you know a dummy for whether teens, whether it was a study of teens. Well, that's there, right? right? And so we had a a dummy for each article. We have to have that. Uh, we would have a dummy for the method of estimation, whether it was a quality experiment or not. We'd have a dummy for whether we, the standard errors were estimated correctly or not. And all of these go into the lasso. What I do, I've got it on my computer, but I need to look at it. I don't know exactly what came out of the lasso, uh, but the lasso, you know. Not everything that went in came, you know, came out. But uh, actually, probably our best bet, frankly, is to go back. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we've got it. Uh, you know, what demographic group? Uh, what industry? Eating and drinking establishments versus. I was wondering on the on the last studies. I mean, I was wondering if if. Uh, whether it was a, a, a cross-sectional or, or a time series or a panel, I mean, whether that was basically part of the structure, or whether that was included. As yeah, part I mean, of the, uh, basically, uh, and I'll check that with Paul. I'm, I'm not convinced this is an exhaustive list. Yeah. But uh, for example, uh, whether it was when we we've got one which is about whether there was a well-defined uh, base group. That's really the distinction there would be between quasi-experiments, which are hard, hardly ever uh, involve a time element, versus panel, which always does. Yeah. So I, 
I'd have to go back and check with Paul. And anticipating, I'm sorry, but anticipating sort of part of the discussion after the talk. No. And what everybody wants to know is sort of like what's the the, the largest minimum wage you can have without screwing up a labor market to some extent. And thinking about basically what the market wage is and what the minimum wage is relative to the market wage. Right. So we're looking at basically the extent to which the mark the, the minimum wage would even have an effect. And the right. degree to which it would, how much higher. Right. Is that come out of your study at all? Or is that something that basically is for future investigation? That, that is a great question. Which is to say, I have an answer for it. Oh, no. uh, that's one of my definitions of a great question. Is this. Uh, let me, I mean, one, and, and I'm going to come back to that in about 30 seconds, just to let you know. These are the uh, linear sums of, say, the base elasticity and the team uh, specific estimate. So there we get a the last I see of 0.034, again, nowhere near statistically significant. And you'll find that straight through here. Nothing except for this selection bias one is statistically significant. The coefficients are very small. Our largest coefficient on the no high school is 0.07. Again, well below even a point elasticity of negative 0.1. So, or much smaller in terms of the effect. So where I come out of this is we're not finding evidence of a meaningful effect on employment. This is consistent with the other work that's been done by Tom Stanley and so on. This is much more up to date and actually uses uh, better methods than Chris used in their last study. And if you get rid of your selection bias, no. uh, dummy, all these others were still in with statistically significant estimates. No. Well, I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought about it. They might very well. That would be an interesting question. Uh, getting back to Norm's question. In fact, you'd want them to do that. What? You would want them to do that because that would it, Everything is going to that, that would say that the removal of bias is very important. Right. And I think everything in your RBP thing hinges on, on you've got a profession that's engaged in bias research, uh, uh, publication at least. Uh, um. Well, I, I would put it as usual, uh, somewhat more neutrally, and say I don't want to, it would be nice to see the degree to which removing control for selection bias influence the other coefficients. You know, it's possible removal of that control would do nothing. But my suspicion is, is that they all become negative and statistically significant. Uh, I mean, isn't that the big story in your research? No. I mean, the big story's not the minimum wage. The big story is, is, is the fickle finger pointed at economists. That's your big story. <laughs> uh, you want to, there, I haven't seen any good pills to fight with. Uh, and, and I admire it, and I believe you're correct. But that's not where I would go with this, because I, that's not a fight. You know, it's the old story about picking fights with people who buy the printer in, in 55-gallon drawers. Uh, but I want to get back to Norm's question, because it's very important, which is this. Our data is really about very moderate increases in the minimum wage, historically federal and state. They're simply not, you know, at the top of the range, it may be as low as 20%, but generally they're in the 10 to 15% range. And so what happens if you walked in and said, well, we're going to raise the minimum wage 50% or 100%. Well, we're going to take the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. And I think uh, from the point of view of the statistical work, uh, I would say that was so far out of the range of experience that I, given we have a backward looking method here, that would leave us in a very, uh, we can't really say much about that from here. This is the history in the US has been very moderate increases and we're simply not finding an effect there. Uh, how far up could we go? Well, uh, 
Alan Kruger at Kingston, the New York Times, and he says, we think we can go to 12 bucks an hour. And I suspect that one could do that with, very, with small, little to no employment effect. You wouldn't have to worry about it. But there's another issue. If I could take a moment, I'd like to talk about places where this research needs to go. Because there are some, you know, a whole bunch of graduate students in here who might want to do some of this. Uh, although I'm not sure I'd recommend that. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a, a moment. Uh, one of the things that we need to think about here is we know these elasticities are pretty small. In fact, given you know what we know is that if you have an elasticity of negative 0.1 or 0.2, it still means that individuals as a whole benefit. The entire group benefits, even if individuals within that group lose employment. Okay, so that shifts us over to a different and very important issue, and that is what sort you know is going to be a very different world from let's say people who are potentially disemployed by the minimum wage are regularly moving between jobs. So what happens is you boost the minimum wage to $12 an hour, and maybe you create some disemployment. Maybe that is somewhat out of range. But if people are regularly moving between jobs, and you push their wage up that much, it sounds more like a paid vacation than it does a labor market disaster. All of the individuals in that group, are, you know, the vast majority, have more money in their back pocket and they have time off called unemployment, but they'll move into another job pretty soon to sort of move between that McDonald's theory of the uh, low wage and labor market. If, on the other hand, you've got a few people who suffer very long spells of disemployment because of boosting the minimum wage, you have a somewhat different world. So one of the key issues in terms of minimum wage policies is to take a harder look at the low wage population and their labor market experience. How much are people regularly moving in and out of employment, which puts us into case one. Their wages are up and their hours are down, so life is better. Or does, is there a very negative effect on some detectable subgroup in there? Uh, I know this is an important question because Larry Michelle has called me up and said I got a research on it, but there's a lot of research to be done to kind of sort that out. Another extremely important issue on minimum wage research <coughs> is whether increases in the minimum wage increase family income. Okay? Why? Well, we know it increases earnings. So there's huge evidence that the hourly earnings of low income or low earnings workers after minimum wage go up. But, and so we would think that it would improve family income. But we actually have little to no research on that. Uh, Joe Salvia has done some work with the SIP on that, and he says there's no effect, but he's got some issues with seam bias, and he's overlooked and so on, but he's used that. Arian Dube has done some work uh, which suggests that increases in the minimum wage boosts the wages of sub-poverty families, boosts the earnings of sub-poverty families. Uh, that's encouraging, but a little bizarre, because uh, the work Paul and I have done suggests that, you know, the typical issue is, does minimum wage boost people out of poverty or force them back in? And the, the vast evidence is that it can't do either. One, because people have it below the U.S. poverty line. And poverty line in the U.S. is about destitution. It's not about genteel poverty. You know, in Salt Lake City, uh, the you know a family which is at the poverty line is at about twenty-two thousand dollars a year. Family four on a low budget that was originally established by DLS, which is sort of no savings, uh, no movies, uh, no money going into pensions, no vacations, a very minimal lifestyle. In Salt Lake City, that would be about $43,000 a year for a family of four, so about twice the poverty line. So as I said, in the US, we use the term poverty 
but it actually means destitution. So, I don't really think that boosting the minimum wage is going to have much effect on people at or below the poverty line because their intersection of the labor market is pretty modest. If you take a look, I've got some additional slides here where I talk about that, but we're not going to get to those today. The place we expect to see it are low-income working population. The low-income working population may be starting at about the poverty line and going up to twice the poverty. We don't have any good research on that currently. That's kind of a big open uh, area for doing research and looking at it. And it's especially interesting because there's a lot, you know, it would tell us a lot about, in a sense, almost ground zero the minimum wage. The purpose of the minimum wage isn't to boost people's earnings, it's to boost their income. And so we'd like to be able to see whether indeed it boosts the income of lower-income working families. So that, that's a good area to work in. I'm going to throw one last thing in, and then I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm a very patient audience. But for graduate students, I have to recommend that you keep away from minimum wage research if you want to get it published. Now, that will sound funny. Uh, it's because I just told you some great topics and why it's a lot of fun, and it, but it's damn hard. It has been damn hard over the last 20 years to get stuff that finds that there isn't an effect published. I have never gotten the worst referee reports talking about publication fines. I had one, Paul and I had one referee report where the guy started out saying, well, I'm a labor economist, so I really don't know much about time series. And by the third point, he was telling us that we were doing our uh, uh, Ranger tests incorrectly. Well, he was wrong, but you know, there's a certain point where you, you know, you you know which way the wind is blowing, and there's no point in fighting back. But it's very when you work in controversial areas, if you're not with the people who are in the majority, it's hard to publish that stuff. So consider yourselves Mirandized now. How's that? <laughs> uh, well, I've read along more than long enough. So, uh...